Hi, we're talking to Brian Alexander today uh, from Nightly. Brian, why don't you introduce yourself and, and Nightly? Greetings, Howard, and uh, greetings, DML Verse. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the senior fellow for Nightly. And Nightly stands for the National Institute for Technology and Liberal Education. It's a nonprofit that works with small liberal arts colleges and universities across the U.S. Uh, we help these schools with research and strategic thinking about new technologies and how they impact these campuses. I'm the senior fellow, which means I research emerging technologies uh, and I translate them for this world. So that involves looking at everything from gaming to digital storytelling to open education resources and trying to model the future of higher education. So I, I know you've been working a lot with new learning resources lately. Why don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit about what that what that's about. Well, it's a, it's a phrase that we use to try to get our arms around several new technologies that we see impacting higher education right now. And these are not, these are movements, so no specific brand of technology. These are ways of organizing digital media. So one of them is ebooks, uh, a second is gaming, and a third is open education resources. And we picked these because they're all at the level of already having an impact on daily life. These are not pie-in-the-sky technologies. These are already production-level tools. At the same time, they're still emergent. They're still developing. They're still growing. Some of them are not yet clearly sustainable. And so there's a lot of research to be done in looking at how they can be used and then finding cases of them actually being used and trying to share best practices and how people use them. Uh, ebooks, for example, right now seem to have passed a major tipping point in the general population. Sometime last year, they went from being kind of geeky, kind of fringe to mainstream, partly through the iPad, partly through the Kindle. We saw gaming. Gaming has become a huge industry around the world. It's a mainstream culture tool for most of the human race. And education, we've been finding ways for it to approach college campuses in all kinds of ways, from the library to the classroom to research. And when it comes to open education resources, again, these are being used. Everything from MIT's OpenCourseWare to Carnegie Mellon's OLI to different individuals making use of open content licenses. And all of these are very, very powerful and have multiple affordances that we're still trying to tease out. So what does this have to do with your, your constituency, the liberal arts schools? Well, it's different for individual disciplines and in some situations it's different by campus. Um, for example, we find that gaming tends to be very appealing to the social sciences, often the non-quantitatively intensive social sciences, such as poli-sci and history, but also the humanities, either from people who are using games to teach subjects with, such as history or even uh, literature, to people wanting to use games as objects of study, as examples of new media. And that's an interesting disciplinary skew for small colleges. Um, Ebooks, on the other hand, seem to be cross-disciplinary, perhaps with a larger emphasis on the sciences. Um, and that appeals to our campuses in part because their libraries tend to be smaller than Research One universities. And so they're trying to figure out how to grapple with this massive digitization migration of books from print to digits. But also because we're trying to see what the pedagogical affordances are. What does it mean to read on a Kindle, to read on an iPad, to read on a phone? Are we in the era, for example, of social reading, where you and I, Howard, can read the same book separated by a continent and then share our annotations through the web or through mutual devices? Do we then perhaps read through social media, where the two of us are part of a larger crowd working through a single text that's parsed through common press? So I mean, trying to figure out the specific technology is in some ways not as important as looking at how we actually make use of it. And when it comes to open education resources, it seems the sciences are really in the lead. You look at MIT's OpenCourseWare, dominated by the sciences, of course. You look at OLI from Carnegie Mellon, and it's overwhelmingly aimed at the sciences and quantitative fields. So that's that kind of unevenness of disciplinary curricular deployment is something that we're trying to understand. You know, this reminded me of something that, that's maybe a little tangential to what you're talking about right now, but um, I think it was maybe 10 years ago when you were still in the classroom yourself, didn't you use some kind of game to teach the Vietnam War? Yes, yes. I was uh, teaching a class to two colleagues on three campuses, 
and teaching a class on the American experience in Vietnam, the political scientist came up with the idea of a simulation game that all students could play, where they each took roles as decision makers in 1964-1965 in the Johnson administration's decision to escalate the war in Vietnam. And so the historian of the three of us helped digitize a tremendous amount of materials. And I, as the humanist and also as the geek, managed to help organize a game where 40-odd students over a week simulated a year and a half of political decision-making. It was a terrific experience because the students really had to imbibe and integrate their thinking about very complex and challenging materials. And then, as political scientists and historians know, sinking yourself down into a game about history opens up your understanding of possibilities. The events that, in retrospect, look so foreordained and so determined become more complex, more unstable, more uncertain. You can really see decisions as live things, not just as automatic blunders. Uh, it was a fascinating experience. I did this more than 10 years ago using HTML, and it was a very, very powerful, effective setup. I mean, over the past decade, we've seen so many other ways of using games to really help students immerse themselves in complex situations. Gaming is just one of the powerful tools we've got. So speaking of being 10 years ahead, I know that you've been doing some, some, some work with futures What's, what's that about? What, what is Knightley doing in, in terms of futures? Well, we're trying to help colleges think through strategically the future of higher education and their institution in that landscape. And there's a, there's a whole battery of futures methods that are out there being used by corporations, by nonprofits, by governments, from prediction markets to Delphi reports to environmental scanning. And we want to translate and bring all those methods to small colleges to help them get a better handle on where their students might be in five years, where their disciplines might be in 10 years, how admissions and alumni relations could change, what study abroad would mean when, for example, most people communicate with smartphones. What does it mean to have students across the United States coming to campus in an age of augmented reality? So, and a lot of the features aren't necessarily technological. They can be demographic changes about, say, aging or racial makeup. They can be institutional changes about cost or business models. So we're trying to help these schools have ways of thinking about the future in a structured and provocative way, uh, which is not trivial. It's actually very difficult for us to throw our minds forward. Um, it's easy to think about what we might be doing tomorrow as individuals, but to think about a complex institution involving thousands of people over a decade is very, very challenging. What, and what, are, what are one, one or two of the most interesting things that, that your prediction markets have, have indicated? <laughs> well, one, one thing that we found was uh, a sense of the uh, rhythm of daily life in campuses and how, um, in some ways, it's, it's what you might expect from higher education, that we tend to find very optimistic trading happening in spring and summer, and then fall turned everyone into pessimists. Um, at first, we thought it was a seasonal issue, but then we realized it was actually the sense of the looming fall semester, and how, with the end of spring, and that old 19th central academic calendar, people expected that an opening, a possibility was there. Another thing we found, um, to our surprise, um, was a lot of optimism about open access and open education resources. Um, we, um, we were surprised by this because the adoption of open content still seems to be gradual, incremental, not yet uh, uh, logarithmic and more exponential. And uh, we found that people were very optimistic about the number of open access journals available, about the number of open content items that are available. Uh, and that for us was a real eye opener. And we hope they're right. Fascinating. Thank, thank you so much, Brian. Well, thank you, Howard.